Welcome back for yet another message from the Little Church World. If you are coming for the first time to watch our videos, I want to thank you and welcome you. For those of you returning, welcome back. We are continuing to explore the great riches and truths that the Bible offers and finding ways to practically apply those to our lives. Spend some time with us over the next 20 or so minutes as we explore yet another practical truth that the Bible can offer us this week. Hello and welcome to another message from TLC World where we aim not just to analyze scripture or produce well put together messages, but where we also strive to draw lessons from the Bible for modern Christian living. With this in mind, I want to focus on the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness today because I'm convinced it offers Christians many lessons relevant to living a Christ-centered life in this modern day and age. Let's go to the most comprehensive description of the wilderness experience, which can be found in Luke 4, verses 1 to 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in all instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. To provide a full picture of what took place in the wilderness, I want to add one more verse to the passage from Luke, something he does not mention but that is found at the end of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4. It reads, Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him, and that's in verse 11. So let me now begin with the fact that God gives us opportunities to practice living in faith when we commit our lives to Christ. To understand this point, we need to know that just before Jesus was sent by God into the wilderness, he went to John the Baptist to be baptized. As Mark 1 verses 9 to 12 records, At that time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness. I believe that Jesus' baptism, followed quickly by a time of testing, represents a preview of God's development plan for human beings. I'm convinced that formal commitment to Christ will sooner or later be followed by a period or event which will test and enable us to demonstrate the commitment we have made, not just in words but in action. I experienced this myself and I've seen it time and again in the lives of others. In fact, commitment to Christ is just the start of a lifelong journey in which followers are trained to develop character and become overcomers, a characteristic especially favoured by Christ our Lord, who is the ultimate overcomer. He puts it this way in Revelation 3 verse 21. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, 
as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. The description of Jesus' testing in the wilderness also represents a warning to Christ followers of the various tactics employed by Satan to undermine their commitment and obedience to Christ. Let me outline a few of them. The first attack Jesus experienced in the wilderness focused upon physical desire. Fully aware that he hadn't eaten for 40 days, Satan challenged Jesus to use his power to turn stones into bread. Christ, however, did not succumb, and instead he quoted a familiar scripture from Deuteronomy 8, verse 3, namely that man shall not live on bread alone. In today's world, physical temptation remains a key focus of satanic attacks in an attempt to pull Christ followers into disobedience. Pornographic materials, alcohol and drugs are some of the obviously negative things he uses to tempt mankind away from God. But there are many other temptations of the flesh that don't carry such negative perceptions, but will still lead people to disobedience. So whenever he sees a weakness, he will try to tap into it. We should therefore become aware of our own weaknesses and not underestimate the power of his pull on the physical, especially in the environment Satan has engineered to exist on earth at this time. For some abominable activities in God's eyes are approved by society which makes them seem to be acceptable. Satan's next line of attack on Jesus was to offer power and riches. This offer is a real temptation on the part of the enemy today. He fosters and preys on the fact that he can easily deceive the powerful and wealthy into believing that God is irrelevant. That is, of course, until ultimately they realize the truth of the scripture. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, which is in Philippians 2 verse 10. Sadly, however, those who have rejected Christ steadfastly in this world will come to this realization too late. A particularly vulnerable group of people are those chasing fame and fortune. For Satan has had much success in convincing many from within this group to sell their souls to him. This is heartbreaking because there is no way back for them unless Jesus intervenes. The old film Rosemary's Baby is worth watching if you've never seen it because it represents the reality as it has always existed on the dark side of life. Now if you think what I'm saying sounds unbelievable, spend a little time researching, for in this day and age of people speaking out, a number of stars who have gained their fame through such means are beginning to speak out. This happens particularly when they discover their mentor, Satan, holds them in a grip of iron and wreaks his own revenge if they fail to comply in every way. Pride is another major stumbling block to acceptance of Christ. Satan's challenge to Jesus to throw himself down from the highest point of the temple was a direct appeal to Christ's pride. Satan knew that Christ, the master of all things and creator of the universe, could call down armies of angels to rescue him from the fall. However, he was also fully aware that if Jesus did this, the awesome demonstration of power that would result would simply be a demonstration of pride equivalent to saying, look what I am capable of. Of course, this was never going to happen in the case of a Christ who chose to be born a humble carpenter's son and also chose to die the most humiliating death on the cross to give everyone in the human race an opportunity for salvation. The point I'm trying to make here is that it is only when man is stripped of pride that he can be in full relationship with Christ. This is a universal principle of victorious Christian living and is particularly difficult to apply in modern society which encourages us to put self first. When pride rears its ugly head, it's well worth remembering the words of scripture that state, the Lord detests all the proud of heart 
Be sure of this, they will not go unpunished. And that's from Proverbs 16, verse 5. I'm firmly convinced that we should view the testing of Jesus in the wilderness in terms of the implication for Christ followers rather than see it as a test for Christ himself. My view is based on the simple fact that we are talking about Jesus Christ, God in human form here, the creator of the universe, who already had at his disposal all that Satan, the lesser being, could possibly tempt him with. I have no doubt that in this situation Jesus was making a point and modelling the way for all who choose to follow him. We should also take note of the response that Jesus gave to the devil at this time, for that too provides a lesson for us. He consistently quoted scripture, and we need to do the same. Christ followers, in declaring your allegiance to Christ, you've activated a vicious and ruthless enemy in the devil, and he will stop at nothing to break your allegiance to Christ. There will be times when you feel the searing heat of the spiritual battle, and it's at these times that you need to utilize the supernatural power of Scripture, because God's Word acts as a sword against the work of the devil. If you haven't done so already, it will pay you to learn some verses so that you can speak them out when the war is being raged. When in battle, it's also very important to remember the scripture that states, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And that's from John 1, 4, verse 4. Victory truly belongs to the Lord. I now want to return to the scripture of Matthew that I quoted earlier, and which states, then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. Again, Matthew 4, verse 11. For this reveals the structure that God has ordained in terms of his relationship with man and highlights the connection between obedience and blessing. Christ was totally obedient to his character and calling during the time of temptation. And the result was that immediately afterwards, God sent angels to attend to his needs. This is a principle that Christians need to remember. No matter how difficult things may seem, and no matter how much every fibre of our being rails against it, we need to be obedient to God in times of pain and suffering. Knowing that God will immediately attend to us should be used as an encouragement. Peter reinforces this in 1 Peter 5 verse 10 with the words, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. A key role of Christ in the heavenly realm is as, a, as an intercessor for the human race collectively and individually, meaning he is a prayerful representative of mankind to God the Father. In Romans 8 verse 34 we read, Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honour at God's right hand, pleading for us. His experience in the wilderness makes him the perfect intercessor for us. As Hebrews 4.15 states, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathise with our weaknesses, but we have one who was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. One thing all of this teaches us is that we cannot be complacent. We have an enemy who is looking to see us fall. The fact that he had the audacity to try and bring about the downfall of the all-powerful creator of the universe means he will certainly have no reservations in trying to do the same with individual followers of Christ. We would do well to take on board the words of Peter in 1 Peter 5 verse 8, which warns us to be alert and of sober mind, your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That said, 
Jesus has shown us the way, so we need not fear. We simply need to rest on the power of the word at all times and never forget that he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world, as we read in 1 John 4, verse 4. Now, I'm fully aware that this message has been aimed primarily at Christians. However, if you have not yet made a commitment to Christ, but something in this message has spoken to you, please email me at goodnewsthelittlechurchworld.org and I'll be happy to help you find Christ for yourself. So many thanks for joining me this week, and I hope you join next week for another TLC World message. Until then, goodbye, God bless. Although the message has ended, I would like to urge you to spend some time this week thinking about what you've just heard and trying to find a way to apply it to your life. If you are a new believer or a Christian, I also suggest that you try to reach out to another friend or family member that you know that is a Christian, that you can also ask them your questions and connect with them. If you do not have anyone in your life like this, please feel free to email us at goodnews at thelittlechurchworld.org and we would be more than happy to connect with you. So join us again next week for another message from the Little Church World.